Good morning, and um, welcome to this Water Challenge fo Forum. I'm glad that the European Chamber of Commerce and all its sponsors are uh, involved in this issue with which Dr. Ernie Odonias has championed for so long. I wish, Ernie, that you would give them a copy of all your columns, how many have you written about water. It would be instructional, uh, first for me, as an environmentalist senator, and second, for all, both the private sector and government representatives present here today, to read your well-researched columns so that we could start from there and try to find a solution. While it is good that we are discussing the issue of water, I think we should go beyond discussing water and try to do something about it. Uh, for so long, Congress has also been debating and debating. And we have so many laws, as mentioned. But still, we have millions of people who have no access to clean water. But I, again, I'm going ahead of my prepared speech. So what we need to do is, after this conference and this challenge, we have all your companies out there. I think it is incumbent upon us to make sure that those who are vulnerable, that those who have less in life, so to speak, would have access to clean, potable water. We actually have all the laws in place, including the Clean Water Act, which I will get to later. We have environmental laws beautifully written. I'm proud of it. In the almost 20 years I've been in the Senate since 1998, it was mentioned, the Clean Air Act. But is our air clean? It's not being implemented effectively by government, by the executive department, by the LTO. We have the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law. Republic Act 9003, which I authored and sponsored principally, passed in January of 2001. It's been 16 years. That has a direct impact on water because we must segregate waste at source, recycle, and compost. We must not throw human waste, solid waste, any kind of waste on our waterways. Not on our esteros and canals and rivers and bays and lakes. If we actually segregate waste at source, the, dip, the pictures are different because I'm not starting my speech yet. I'm first extemporizing, so you can relax. Then we would have at least 80% diversion and meaning only 20% of the waste would actually go to the environmentally engineered sanitary landfill. So when I see bodies of water, even inland rivers in this polluted metropolis called Metro Manila, it's become such an unlivable city. But it could be so beautiful because it was with heritage buildings and trees. But what have we done with it? And so if you just implement the laws which I wrote for the past 20 years, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law. My question is, we are in this hotel. What is this hotel called? Marriott. A very sad incident happened two weeks ago nearby. Does this hotel, I want to visit its comfort rooms and its kitchen. Do you actually segregate waste at source, recycle, and compost? If you don't have at least three trash bins, then you're violating my law. Visit my office. I have five bins. Attorney Rachel Herrera, my legal staff here, and Brian, my researcher. You can approach them and ask them, do I have two bins? No, I have five. Because I segregate waste at source. What has it got to do with water? It's got everything to do with water. Because those who don't segregate waste, sometimes, not all of you here, not all of us, tabi, salikud, salikud. Or if you see a body of water, you think it's a trash bin. And you see canals and rivers filled or polluted 
with solid waste. What kind of human beings deserve to live who do that? I'm so embarrassed as a Filipino when I see a river so dirty. I'm proud to come from the province in the Visayas that is host to the cleanest river in the Philippines. That is the province of Antique with the Bugang River in Pandan Antique, the hometown of my grandmother, the hometown of my great grandfather, who incidentally is one of the delegates to the first Malolos Congress who crafted and drafted the first Philippine Constitution. I'm saying it because Independence Day was just celebrated and I was in Malolos where I saw the list of the 97 delegates in the Museum of Baraswine Church, which is a heritage site, and saw the name of my great-grandfather directly, uh, um, the direct lineage, and um, he was one of the delegates in 1800s drafted the first constitution, but that's beside the point. We're from Pandana, Tike, host to Bugang River. If each and every local government would just take hold or be a steward of his or her river, lake, bay, what have we done of Manila Bay? It's so embarrassing. Three regions of the country, 170 more or less, am I correct? 178 local governments. Attorney Tony Aposa already sued the government. He already won. There's a continuing mandamus. Ernie, so this is one of the topics we will discuss in our water summit. But are the agencies of government and the water concessionaires, one of whom is your sponsor, complying? No, they're not. The continuing mandamus states that Wa wastewater treatment must be provided. Sewerage must be complete. Mainilad and Manila water, with all due respect, are non-compliant. That is why there is a case still in the courts or in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court already spoke that the ALG should help out. So many agencies of government the National Water Resources Board, all the 30 agencies of this great republic of the Philippines was sued. And the people of the Philippines won. And the continuing mandamus stays with Justice Velasco compelling the agencies. I sat in a couple of times as a previous chair of the Environment Committee. People sit and talk and talk and talk. The private sector collects and collects and collects, but it's not being implemented. I know my Nilad and Manila water will come to me and explain. They have explained to me and I perfectly understand that there are problems with land acquisition and right of way with local governments. With the great minds of Philippine and foreign engineers, we can find a way to be compliant not just with the continuing mandamus of the Supreme Court, not to throw the waste in Manila Bay, but also to comply with the Clean Water Act, which I authored in 2003. So my legacy to this country, this great, beautiful, clean country, is to please implement our laws, clean air, ecological solid waste, management. Manang Luz Sabas, the mother of ecological solid waste management, just passed on at 89 years old. I was in the wake last night with all the greenies like us. Sonia Mendoza of Eco Waste Coalition, um, uh, Nina Galang, and Greenpeace, uh, Von Hernandez, who's now with uh, all the greenies were there, and we were just preaching to the choir among us and talking how important zero waste lifestyle is. We're such a consumptive, consumptive society. There's so much waste. Why are we actually using bottled water? For the environmentalists, bottled water is a no-no. I bring my own tumbler. So this hotel is actually not compliant because when you think about it, 
It's your fault. You invited me as a speaker. You want me to tell the truth, right? I'm not going to talk about frou-frou policies. It's about time we call a spade a spade. We have the laws. Why are we not complying? I'm the first to comply. See my office. The first water challenge is come to my office. Come to the Senate. And we have our MRF, far from perfect, but in my home, in my office, in my little farm. Ask them how strict I am. Strict, martial law, strict. When it comes to environment. I haven't even started my speech yet. With no offense to Manila Water and Maynila, and to the Philippine government of which I am part of. But imagine if they just followed this young senator in 1998, we would have less problems. As early as the 1990s, I anticipated the dirty air. That's why I enacted the Clean Air Act. Sundin lang nyo, di wala kayong problema, di mababawasan ang pulmonary at saka upper respiratory ailments ng ating mga anak. Pag hiwalay-hiwalayin lang ang basura sa nabubulok at hindi nabubulok, you already have income, livelihoods from solid waste plastics that you can recycle. I use plastic and bottles and cans and use it for organic plants that I grow in my backyard. Ask them. I was asked what I eat for breakfast. Organic arugula and lettuce, which I plant in my backyard on recycled containers, on compost I make myself from dried leaves and food waste. I have a water catchment that catches the water from rainwater, which I use for my plants and use to clean the car. Ask them if it's true. Because why waste rainwater that's gift from mana from heaven. Whenever it rains, I'm so happy. My rainwater catchment has water. Why use my Nilad or Manila water water, which is treated, which you pay for to clean your car, or for your flush, or for your vegetables? Is it not more organic or basic ang tubig ulan ang para sa halaman dahil nature? Doesn't it not make sense? And so, ladies and gentlemen, I've not even started my speech. I'm just telling you basic common sense. And I'm only in my third law. And Eric Acosta here understands where I'm coming from. We share the same soul, environmentally soul. I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. He knows me very, very well. And so I can go into the renewable energy law, I can go into the Climate Change Act. I can go into the People's Survival Fund, into the Environmental Education Awareness Act. And I can go on and on, but now I will read my speech. Or should I just extemporize? So my challenge to you today is, if there's anyone from a water agency of government present here, are you doing your job well? Are you performing your task? If you're from the private sector, do you have a water catchment in your building, in your factory, in your industry, in your home? Does this building have one? All these structures owned by billionaires of the country, are you compliant with their laws, raking in money from consumers? Are you actually following an environmental laws and becoming responsible stewards of the environment, which makes you a responsible citizen of this nation. Think about it. I'm not anti-rich. All I'm saying is that because when you're wealthy and powerful, you have more influence. And because you have a wider reach of influence, it does not mean when you are not powerful or rich that you don't have a voice. Even a bird watcher from Tayabas, Quezon, can have a stronger power and influence than a wealthy person 
because that person whom I met incidentally in a biodiversity forum has more soul than someone who just is a consumptive, greedy, materialistic person. We should care for our air, for our water, for our nature, because that is life. And that spells human survival. And for me, the greatest national security threat of our country are two, terrorism and climate change. And that, of course, includes water. And that translates to the biggest humanitarian challenges of the world. And those are connected. Remember Kidapawan two years ago. Because the government did not prepare our farmers with climate resilient crops and did not provide the water systems necessary, the drought affected the farmers of Kidapawan. And there was a protest and a clash where a few died and so many were injured and women and children were apprehended. Human rights were violated. That was a climate issue brought about by the drought, which brought about tension, violence, and conflict. Now, I'm not sure if I want to read my speech. So water, we see, is a basic need, yet it is a resource that we have taken for granted. Perhaps a seeming abundance of it. As we all know, the Earth is composed of two-thirds water, creates a sense of complacency without realizing that of all the world's water, only 0.5% is suitable for human consumption. In 2015, 91% of the world's population had access to an improved drinking water source, compared with 76% in 1990. About 4.2 billion people now get water through a pipe connection. 2.4 billion access water through other improved sources, such as public taps, protected wells, and boreholes. At least 1.8 billion people around the world use a drinking water source that is fecally contaminated. To me, this is a basic human right. Half of the world's population will be living in water-stressed areas by 2025. That's not my figure. That's based on research. In the Philippines, 8 million Filipinos still lack access to safe water, and about the same number still practice open defecation. As chair of the Committee on Finance, I always ask our agencies to submit what is needed to provide public toilets to the 8 million who still openly defecate, because this is directly connected to the issue of water. While we try to address these problems, we are faced with new challenges. A study by the World Resources Institute revealed that the Philippines will likely experience severe water shortage by 2040 due to the combined impact of rapid population growth and climate change. The Philippines ranks 57 out of 167 countries that are highly vulnerable to severe water shortage. Moreover, Water affects our food security, as agriculture accounts for 70 to 85 percent of our water consumption. But water security is not only about the provision of sufficient water for the needs of our people and our economic activities. It is also about having healthy ecosystems and building resilience to water-related disasters, including storms, floods, and droughts. How many people have said, we have so much water, but still no water. An archipelago of 30 million hectares, and I think 32,000 square kilometers of coastline of 822 coastal municipalities in this country of 100 million people, but still millions of people with no access to safe, potable water. It's really so ironic. Extreme weather events, such as intense, more frequent rains, increasing number of hot days, along with weak resource management, are factors that lead to low water security. The continued overlapping 
and fragmented regulation of water supply services in the country by several government entities is one factor that hinders the enactment of a doable and long-term solution to prevent water shortage. I hope that my bill on right-sizing the bureaucracy will actually solve this problem of overlapping uh, functions and tasks of our water agencies. The degradation of our environment is likewise a threat to water security, especially because forested watersheds and wetlands supply 75% of the world's accessible fresh water. The Senate just passed the ENIPAS law, the 1992 National Integrated Protected Areas System now has an expanded integrated protected areas, the ENIPAS, which I passed on third reading in the previous Congress, passed again, this time by Senator Villar, who's the chairman of the Environment Committee, based on my law, my bill on the ENIPAS, which declares 97, I think, protected areas, both water areas, marine areas, and terrestrial as uh, protected areas. Congress, I think, has been remiss in not speedily passing the protected areas. I think at least in the province of Neric Acosta, Mount Kitanglad, I was the author in my first term, correct? Your ear mountain, Mount Kitanglad is a protected area. I looked at that in my first term. So all of these, I can go on and on. Uh, we can talk about strengthening resilience to water-related disasters. We know that the country needs to evaluate existing programs to combat desertification, to prevent flooding, the flooding in CDO. Perhaps Neric knows this. No less than Mayor Oscar Moreno mentioned this to me in another event I attended in Peninsula a few months back when he said, we realized it, that it was actually the plastics and the solid waste in our canals that caused the instant flooding brought about by the incessant rains, diba? And also denuded mountains and and, and deforested highlands, which caused soil erosion and siltation of the rivers. So all of that put together. So see, it's really man-made, exacerbated by more frequent and more intense typhoons. So believe me, just segregate waste at source, recycle, and compost. You will be healthier and happier and contributing your share towards a healthier environment. In the context of climate change, water management is very crucial. I think I see Dondi Alikpala there. Dondi, yes, you know what I'm talking about. You've heard me talk like this, okay. We have witnessed several times how extreme weather events such as stronger rains and storms have caused massive inundation, claiming lives and destroying livelihoods. I mentioned about Kidapawan, when the locals, the farmers, staged a protest as the climate-related drought affected the lives and livelihood of farming communities. The bloody dispersal, unnecessary, that ensued, that eventually claimed the lives of at least three farmers and several others was totally unnecessary. Water stress amplified by climate change will create or is already creating a growing security challenge. In order to address the water challenge, we need, this is a cliche, a whole of society approach, a holistic approach. But the issue of having 30 water agencies has been a challenge because of overlapping mandates and conflicting programs. And that's what perhaps uh, the water summit envisioned by Dr. Ordonez can do is to actually assess which agencies can be put together, which can be uh, rendered, which is rendered irrelevant, which should be strengthened and given budget. But if all of the 30 agencies are doing their job, let's strengthen them, uh, give them the support, just tell me what you need. But at the same time, we need the cooperation of the private sector. We need to consolidate all water agencies in the country and craft a roadmap for sustainable water use. Much work needs to be done, and it needs everyone's cooperation. We should all be reminded that we are actually only stewards of the earth, not here to exploit, but to sustainably manage our natural resources. Just as it is our right to access clean water, it is also our responsibility to ensure 
that the well never runs dry. With that, I thank you very much for your patience and I enjoin each and every delegate to this water challenge to go home, go to your establishments after this conference and try to do what you can, either in water management or in solid waste management, which is directly connected to the issue of water. Thank you.